This review was made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Hey guys, it's time to talk about the third and final installment of the Descendants franchise. They got a lot of ground to cover and even more crap to unpack, so let's just dive right in. This is Descendants 3. Which might still be good. You know it won't be. Before we begin this review, we need to address the elephant in the room. Shortly after production on this movie wrapped, Cameron Boyce, the actor who played Carlos, died of complications from an epileptic seizure. Death is always a tragedy, as was his in particular because he died so young, and some have suggested that I go easy on these movies because he's no longer with us. I have nothing against this kid, I have nothing against anybody who appeared in these movies. They're all doing fine with the material that they've been given. It's just that the material's crap. I'm not here to pick on a young man who left us too soon. I'm here to talk about a movie and the artistic decisions behind it that worked to its disadvantage. I mean no disrespect to Cameron Boyce, his family, or his fans, but I have a movie to review. Our movie begins in... Oregon, I think. As we once again have Mal narrating the backstory and premise, but offering no insight as to why any of this is happening. The kids on the island are excited because they've just received news that more of them will be able to get to the mainland. I'm honestly surprised that Hair Beast allows these people to read the news. I'm not going to apologize for refusing to let this go. Wasn't the point of Belle loving the Beast that he is redeemed as a character? Wasn't she supposed to bring out the good person that was always inside of him? Him rounding up a bunch of people of dubious virtue and leaving them to rot for generations doesn't make a damn bit of sense! Oh, and VK Day is here, because VKs are always what these villain kids were called ever since the first movie. Oh wait, no they weren't! And why does this picture in the paper look like a bunch of mugshots? If it was a bunch of mugshots, that might be kind of clever, but it's actually a graduation photo. So these kids proved they could be functioning members of society? Yep. And they're letting in more kids because these original four were a success. So it would seem. Then why are they only bringing in an extra four? Because. But there were a lot of kids on the island. True. But four's their limit? Yep. Why? Anyway, they sing a song about how some of these kids are getting the opportunity to leave the island, but they have to ruin it by, yet again, having these descendants singing about how gleefully bad they are. It's good to be bad. No, it's not good to be bad! If being bad was good, their parents wouldn't be thrown in here in the first place! And are they choosing who gets to go by having a dance-off? It looks like it, yes! Okay, they are very good dancers, but how does that make them eligible to go back into society? Shouldn't there be an academic component? Good questions all! Baby, you're Gilbert Godfreeding. Relax. <sighs> I'm sorry. I'm cool. Just be chillin' like a villain. You'll be alright. Yeah! You'll also notice how none of the Descendants' parents are ever mentioned again. I guess this is like Bayformers, where each movie just forgets about these characters that used to mean something to the story. And if only four kids get to go ashore, why does everyone have what looks like some kind of official invitation? Did Carlos just wake this kid up by slapping him in the dick? Wonderful. That's how you show how good a character he is, right? You couldn't just ring this bell that's over here? I think that'd do the trick. They shut their stupid gobs and announce their selection of who gets to go back. A decision which is based on what again? And... Wait a minute. No! You wrote the son of a pirate into the second movie, made him nothing but Uma's lackey, 
and just arbitrarily named him the son of Hook, when it would have made so much more sense to make him the son of Smee, and now Smee himself is in this movie? And he somehow got a couple of kids too? What are they supposed to do in this one? We've already got the son of Smee pretending that he's something he isn't. I don't care, the Smeelings are adorable. Yes, the little mini Garths are adorable, but still! I can't believe this day has finally arrived! I honestly wish we could take you all with us, and someday, very soon, maybe we can. Yeah, we're gonna be back here so many times, you're going to be so sick of us. So sick of us. <laughs> we already are! So yeah, they start naming who they're gonna take back with them, starting with Dizzy. <laughs> Hang on. Why is this guy behind Dizzy wearing a tiger on his shirt? I hope this isn't meant to imply that he's the son of Shere Khan, because that would be too many kinds of icky right there. Great, now we're bringing cool cat logic into this world? You fine-looking kitty cat, you! Oh, hush up! You got me doing it! Next on their list are the Smealings, who are named Squeaky and Squirmy. Well done, Mr. Smee. You defied all laws of probability by getting laid, and now you're ensuring that your offspring will never get that chance themselves. And the final villain kid to be selected... And no, I'm not calling them VKs, damn it! ...is Celia, daughter of the Shadow Man, Dr. Facilier. He named her Celia Facilier? Apparently the Shadow Man's favorite book is Amelia Bedelia. I'm back. I think you mean, I am ready! We're going to Disneyland! Huh. Now that I think about it, just calling this movie Disneyland would make so much more sense. Some weird alternate reality where all of these Disney properties intermingle with each other without having any danger of interfering with their own stories? Why not? It sure works for Stan's place. Continuity! Boom. An undisclosed amount of time later, we find Mal keeping an eye on Uma in her... formal... elegant... Sentry dress? I think if Uma was up to something, we'd know by now. No, Ben, I know how villains think. No, you don't. If you did, then you would have just politely asked her to go away, and then she would, because apparently that's how villains think! Ben points out that he's got the entire security staff looking out for her. Then what was the point of Mal being out here in the first place? So they go join the welcoming committee to welcome the new kids. Wait, Mal just came back from the island. Why did she sneak away from all this just so she could change clothes and look at the island she just got back from? Also in attendance is Ben's old girlfriend, Audrey, and wow, this is awkward. This movie series goes through the trouble of retconning Aurora and her family from white to black for the sake of diversity, ignoring that there are plenty of other ways to do that which wouldn't be quite so head-tilting. And then it gives her straight platinum blonde hair, its ridiculousness accentuated by putting her right next to her black grandmother. And I think they made her more pale than Chad. Disney, you do understand that there is no point in bringing in these non-white people if all you're going to do is just make them white, don't you? It's not making it easy to defend this movie. No, but it's making it more hilarious. <gasps> Wait a minute. Did they just slap a ponytail on Dopey Jr.? Okay, he's a nerd, he's a nice guy, and he's got the balls to ask out the fairest in the land. Evie saw that, and she fell hard for him. That's all he needed! I loved him for that! But what's this? Are they trying to make him edgy? He's not supposed to be in a boy band, he's supposed to be in the band band! <laughs> but... You like nice guys, nerds, and long hair. Is this really a problem? It wouldn't be if it had been introduced in the first movie. We've got white black people and now edgy nerds. Come on, Disney. It isn't helped by Doug's dancing. He looks more like Urkel going gangsta. <laughs> Bippity boppity one, two, one, two. Can everybody hear me? I know this girl in the wheelchair can hear you. These movies have been very keen to put her front and center whenever they can, just to show us how inclusive they are. Never mind how they don't make her actually do or say anything, which makes her little more than a piece of set dressing. What matters is that she's here. What's up, Ordon? All cheer for his royal majesty, King Stand-Up Comic! Mel, did I mention I'm in love with you? I'm 
met this girl who rocked my world like it's never been rocked. And well done, movie. You tried to make Doug cool and you turned him into Tiny Tim. If I fall to you, never fall to me. I feel happy and fine. Ha ha! Living in the sunlight, loving in the moonlight, having a wonderful time. Ben proposes to Mal, stealing the spotlight from what was meant for the new villain kids, and she accepts. Yes, it makes our movie night seem a little tame. I love you. Movies. <sighs> it's not entirely clear as to how much time has elapsed between movies, as opposed to Bayformers, which you can date by who's who in the White House at the time. But with these kids holding what appears to be some kind of degree, it's obvious that some time has passed between this movie and the first. Are you telling me that in all this time, neither Doug or Evie has said that they love each other, and this is still something to be tiptoed around? Again, Doug's got quite the pair on him, and he's not afraid of expressing himself. Shouldn't he have dropped the L-bomb a long time ago? And we may not know how much time has passed, but Ben was 16 in the first movie. Disney, can we stop trying to marry kids off right out of high school? So yeah, now that Ben and Mal are officially a thing, their couple name is Banal. Of course, Audrey takes this as well as can be expected. You'd really rather have a VK on the throne than me? What is wrong with you people? Whoa, hey, what do you mean by you people? What could she mean by you people? Now that I think about it, I don't really know. Congratulations. You won in fair and square. Oh, wait, no, you didn't. You spelled Ben to destroy all of Oridon. Touching story for the grandkids. Yeah, no. This girl grew up in the most wretched hive of scum and villainy in which one could grow up. You expect me to believe that she wouldn't know how to bite back after getting a little snark? Or can she only do that with card-carrying villainesses? She politely bows out, not out of a sense of taking the higher road, but because she's legitimately too flabbergasted to do anything the slightest bit villainous in retaliation, and she drives back to the island to pick up the new arrivals. Do you have everything? Yes, I have everything. Holy crap. I can't tell what's more ridiculous. The fact that they hired an Asian woman to play the French Lady Tremaine, or the fact that they hired an Asian girl to play Dizzy, but I couldn't even tell before now since they made her up in the last movie to look like she was white. Again, this isn't how you diversity, Disney. They cross back to the mainland and- wait, 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 wait. Who is this guy? With the goggles and the pink cat helmet? Is this the son of the Cheshire Cat? Why not? We've already got the son of Shere Khan in here. No, it isn't. It can't be Hades. Because the Beast, having the power to imprison and hold a god, is without exaggeration or hyperbole, the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life! But then again, it's Descendants, which means that they do six impossibly stupid things before breakfast. It is Hades who's trying to escape, because the beast somehow does have the power to imprison a god. Good lord, the floodgates of questions that arise with him being here. How did the beast capture him? Why did the beast capture him? If for some reason he believes that Hades actually might exist, why would he throw him in here instead of letting him stay in the underworld? Who's caring for the dead in his absence? If Hades exists, does that mean that every god or deity in the Disney canon exists? Why don't we see the Titans in here? Wouldn't they be seen as more villainous than Hades? What about the Fates? Surely they could be regarded as the most evil villains of all time, since they're literally responsible for every death in the history of mankind, right? No, no, no. What about Chernobog? If the Beast is going to imprison any god, why not the god of evil himself? Ugh, so it's up to Mal to stop him. And how does she defeat Hades, god of the underworld? By blowing on him. Yeah. You'd think that she would blow fire at him, but no. She just blows some air at him. And this stops him because Legos. 
And no, I don't care that they call the plural Lego in Lego Masters. It's Legos, damn it! We later find Audrey crying to herself as she writes in her diary, and I seriously can't believe that this movie is trying to make her a sympathetic character. She was a one-dimensional mean girl who went through boyfriends like tissue paper in the first movie, she was all but completely dropped from the second movie, and now they want us to feel sorry for her? I'm sorry, but in the words of Jiminy Cricket, You buttered your bread, now sleep in it! She sings about how she's lost everything, and something inside her is compelling her to go to that museum where all these evil artifacts are just waiting for any angry, hormonal teenager to make off with. Why was she able to turn off the museum's security system with far more ease than the seasoned thief? Well done, writers. I never thought of myself as me. And I get that this is supposed to be a big Irma Gerd moment as she steals Maleficent's magic staff, but I have no idea how we're supposed to be scared of this when the first movie told us that the mistress of all evil could be defeated if you look at her the wrong way. And you have all these deadly artifacts like the Evil Queen's Basket of Poisoned Apples, the Scissors of the Fates, and the Black Cauldron. But she goes for Maleficent's staff? Combine that with the new purple hair and the outfit? <laughs> this just makes her look like a Mal fangirl. Wait a minute, the Black Cauldron is in this movie? Why isn't the Horned King on the island? If anyone is deemed villainous enough for that kind of fate, wouldn't it be him? Or what about the Evil King inhabiting the Black Cauldron itself? There was once a king so cruel and so evil that even the gods feared him. Since no prison could hold him, he was thrown alive into a crucible of molten iron. There his demonic spirit was captured in the form of a great black cauldron. If the beast has the power to collect all of these villains, why wouldn't he do that with this evil prick? And why is the black cauldron so small? It's supposed to be big enough for a whole human body to fit into it, but here, they turn it into the Black Chamber Pot. Take a crap at it and it gives you an army of deathless soldiers made of poo. <laughs> On the topic of things that don't belong, what is Audrey even doing here in the first place? Okay, so she's pissed off at her old boyfriend for being with another girl, so naturally her motives immediately jump to taking over the world? Of course! And what she would deserve is the lights blowing up, apparently? The next day, the former King President Dictator for Life for a couple of decades beast called together a meeting. Sorry, but what kind of authority does this guy have now that Ben wears the crown? The people are in a panic about Hades. He almost got out. Look at him hold back a laugh there. He wants to say, Yeah, and who put all these villains here in the first place, Dad? I'm supposed to protect Oridon. You did. You do protect Oridon. One. Ben is right. You stopped Hades. What is everybody worried about? Two, since when is it your job to protect Oridon? I thought you were just Ben's arm candy. They get word that the staff of Maleficent has been stolen. Why wouldn't they have been alerted of that hours ago? What is it, 1 p.m. right now? And they leap into action to get it back. Now. What do we do? Wait, what? What are you asking her for? You've got an entire court's worth of advisors, the collective kings, queens, and their courts and armies of all the other kingdoms in the stupid United States of Oridon. What the hell is Mal gonna do? And what the hell is she wearing? Is that a dragon in the shape of a heart? Ugh, I think I'm gonna be sick. I think that there's only... one way to guarantee their safety. And that has been Mal devised her ultimate solution, my fear! I think that we have to close the barrier. Forever. No. Son. No. Ben. Oh, no, no, no. Ben. Why are you running away? For better or worse, this is essentially the group of advisors that he, the king, assembled. If he doesn't agree with Mal's suggestion, then he says, Thank you for your input, but I'm not doing that. Anyone else? No? Okay, here's what we're going to do. 
You don't storm off to pout in your room while your daddy apologizes for things not going your way. I repeat, you are the king. Your future queen, emphasis on future, has a plan of action that you can't live with. You thank her for her advice, but explain that you can't do that. Are you so pussy whipped that you can't say no to her? King Ben the Ballas, first of his name. If you think this movie can still be good, let's hope it does so quickly. We've only got 80 minutes left of this train wreck. And why is Belle dressed like a table setting? The curse is lifted, in case you hadn't noticed. By the way, you gotta love how Mal doesn't care one iota about how Dizzy, Celia, and the Smealings are forever blocked from their families. Oh well, collateral damage. It's okay, because we're the good guys. Seriously, when are we gonna get Ben breaking down and yelling at his dad for creating this problem? We then cut to... Uh... B&B &B that Evie runs? And wow, that is a shitty Photoshop job right there. They really couldn't spend a hundred bucks on making a prop sign just for this shot. Mal tells Evie about their new security measures, without mentioning that they were her idea, and Evie isn't entirely on board. Are they seriously thinking that no one will ever go in or out of the aisle ever again? You know what, we never get to go back and see our parents? Oh well, yeah, you guys had parents once upon a time, didn't you? Now that we're done setting up the ammunition for the end of the second act, where it's revealed that Mal was the one who thought of sealing off the island forever, we see the other descendants preparing for Jane's birthday party. These. Hey. I really think she's gonna like the cake, you guys. Oh, yeah? Oh, no. Oh. Okay. Who got into Jane's cake? Delicious. I especially love the lack of dirt. Implying that they ate dirt? I guess that's what they meant by dirt poor? Waka waka. I especially love the lack of dirt. And the lack of flies. Flies? They eat dirt and flies? My god, how are these kids even alive right now? Did the beast forget that he actually has to feed his prisoners? Or do they all follow the Jim Carrey's Grinch diet? I really don't like them. Mm -mm. No, I don't. Audrey poofs her way to the B&B, &B, because she knew Mal would be there somehow. And naturally, Mal doesn't react to her holding the magical equivalent of an automatic rifle. It takes several seconds for Mal to react accordingly, and Audrey uses it to turn Mal into an old crone. You think Ben will love you now, you old hag? Yes. Ben, dearie. Audrey cast an evil spell on me and turned me into an old crone. She did? Yes. Oh dear. Well, come along. Let's get you to a hospital so we can reverse it. Thank you, you're a peach. Ah, but remember, Ben is strongly anti-magic. Oh, you mean stupid. Pardon me, I forgot. Then again, I can't exactly award any smart points to Audrey right now. Why didn't she just make Mal explode or something? Then she poops away without even trying to do anything to the other kids. I'm going to exact revenge on all who have wronged me with naught but a wave of my magical staff. Bye now! Whoa! Uh, you might want to think of a spell for that. There's no spell that can reverse the curse of the scepter. Bullshit! If there's magic out there that can be wielded by non-magic users like the beast that's strong enough to imprison gods, there's a spell that can reverse a little aging. The only thing more powerful than the scepter is Hades Ember. Oh yeah, there's nothing that can undo a curse of the staff except for this one thing, which is still not powerful enough to break a magic barrier. And what was the point of establishing that Evie was really smart in the first movie if she isn't going to use that intelligence to her advantage? Why wouldn't she know how to conjure up a potion that could reverse this, especially since it's a spell that she should be familiar with? Someone forgot to put logic into this movie. They need to get Hades' his ember from the island, and Celia is the only one who knows where it is. I'm his errand rat. I've got the key on my dad's. You're coming. We have to protect the kingdom from evil, but I'm old and ugly. Come with me, child, so we can endanger ourselves and the kingdom. It's personal now. Yeah, remind me again why they can't just give Audrey a Care Bear stare like they did with Maleficent in the first movie? You'd think she'd be more dangerous than Audrey since she's been practicing magic for years, right? Guys, go get your stuff. Come on, boys, let's go. How bad is it? You age beautifully. She's aging like milk. <laughs> and despite how she's so frail that she can't even stand up straight, 
Apparently, she can ride her hog just fine. They couldn't just put her in a little sidecar or something? Why is she even going on this little errand anyway? Wouldn't it make more sense to leave this little old lady at home where she'll be comfortable? Carlos, you're gonna miss Jane's birthday! Wait, why couldn't he just tell Jane that he's got this really important thing to do? Because drama. Audrey crashes Jane's birthday party, and just like Mal, everyone just looks kind of confused. Why is nobody afraid of her? Why does nobody realize how dangerous this magical staff of Maleficent is? Time out! Time out. First off, great new look. I absolutely love feathers. But hey, before you do whatever you're going to do, I was wondering if maybe you wanted a uh, loyal boyfriend by your side? Huh? Partner in crime? Sidekick? Or maybe just a lackey to uh, do your bidding? Um, change tires? Or smoothie runs? Huh? Prince Chad. Son of Cinderella and Prince Charming is nothing but a social climber, completely devoid of charm. I don't think this is the wish her heart made. You're supposed to be defending these movies. Not that anyone's complaining, of course. Shut up. Happy Yeah, no. Try as you might, you are not pulling off the Ultron creepy thing, honey. There are no strings on me. If she's gonna commit some kind of villainous deed while singing Happy Birthday, why doesn't she make everyone old like she did to Mal? The Enchanted Lake. Sweet dreams. You don't want to make sure that Jane's asleep like everyone else? Why don't villains ever wait to see if their evil plans work out? As standard villain practices go, we must now conveniently leave the room and assume that the killing device achieves its purpose. That, and because it's also closing time, and I'm ready to go home. Jane calls Ben, who was conveniently not at the party like he should have been, to tell him just what happened. I'm gonna call Mom and tell her to get her wand. Why don't you take this water pump and wake everyone up by shooting magic water at them? And why didn't Mal and her friends go to get the wand themselves? It's been the MacGuffin of choice for the last two movies, so why did everyone else just forget about it now? Why did they have to make up this Ember of Hades bullshit when we clearly have something that's supposed to be stronger than Maleficent's magic? Oh wait, it's not clearly stronger than Maleficent's magic, since Maleficent was able to just completely brush off the very magic that imprisoned her in the first place and GOD THIS MOVIE'S STUPID! We cut back to the kids on the island, and how nice that the old crone spell just happens to undo itself because of the island's anti-magic field. You'd think maybe you would also turn Mal's mother back into Malitha Squeaky when she got back to the island, but why should we expect things to start making sense now? Hey! I'm me again! Duh, evil magic doesn't work here. Kind of the point. Oh! Evil magic doesn't work here! No! I'm sorry, but what did Mal say at the beginning of the first movie? No magic. No Wi-Fi. No way out. That's it. No magic. No mention of evil magic being banned here. Just no magic. Period. But, okay. For the sake of argument, let's say that this anti-magic barrier was just meant to quell evil magic, even though it was never described as doing so before now. What then exactly is good or evil in reference to magic? It can be used both ways. That is why you must always be careful. Ben makes a huge stink over Mal using her spellbook, but what does she use her magic for? To make herself read faster? That doesn't sound evil to me. What about taking a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a glass of milk and turning them into a feast? That sounds like the opposite of evil, and it might solve a lot of problems. Oh, but the fairy godmother plucking a bunch of people from their homes and throwing them onto a penal island for generations, that's good magic, huh? And this good magic is also keeping the god of the underworld from doing his very important job. Who's taking care of the dead? Hades' his little minions? Coming, you most lugubrious nerd! Is death still a thing? If people still die, what happens to them? Are they stuck in purgatory? And the first movie says that they get no Wi-Fi either. 
Is Wi-Fi evil too? Why did Mal, the daughter of a sorceress and fledgling sorceress herself, need to be reminded of the anti-magic thing by the girl whose deepest dabbling in magic is in the form of palm reading? How many ways can there possibly be to say how stupid this all is? Ugh, they need to get the key to Hades' lair. Why can't Hades' Aaron Rat just ask him to let her in? So they fetch the key at... Dr. Facilier's Voodoo Arcade? So... Dr. Facilier isn't trying to... swindle people out of their hard-earned money or steal their souls or anything. He just... has an arcade? I... Baby, what? It's okay, baby. Let's just get through this. Nice to see the Faciliers on speaking terms with his friend from the other side. I seem to remember their relationship having a hitch or two. Andre! No! I'm not ready at all! I just need a little more time! No, oh, no, please don't! I promise I'll pay your back! I promise! So you got going on with them shiny people. No hustle. I got friends on the other side. Ugh, as much of a groaner as that line is, it's the least offensive thing anyone said in this whole damn trilogy. And these two seem to have a rather close relationship. How unvillain-like. Meanwhile, Audrey's, um, rampage finally makes the news. Alerts of his sleeping spell keep coming in as it spreads throughout Oregon. Uh, guys? Come look at this. There are rumors that Sleeping Beauty's daughter, Audrey, is behind the spell. We're trying to discover who is responsible for these vicious lies and which villain has perpetrated this evil. This is Joe Big Jumping the Gun for fake news. Oh, come on. Nailed it. Wow, rookie mistake. Rookie mistake? What does that mean? Did they leave their keys in the ignition? How the hell can these kids make any kind of rookie mistake in this place when they grew up here? Catch me if you can! I'm off to get more guy liner! Ta-ta! That's when Jay busts out his Aladdin-like parkour, leaps over the entire city, and cuts him off. Don't you mean Jafar-like parkour? Yes, that's what I mean. <laughs> While this pointlessness is happening, Celia takes Mal to Hades' secret underground lair. Hey. How big is that dog? Well, in the original movie, he was about three stories high, so I'm gonna say in this one, he's gonna be... I don't know, not very big at all. You're right. You don't know. Give the movie a chance, baby. How big is that dog? You'll see. They make their way inside, but right now, all I can wonder is why they put this teenage girl in tight leather pants that unzips from behind. There are only so many thoughts that can arise from this kind of imagery, and very little of it is legal. Come, come. After they ride a loud and incredibly slow minecart down a shaft that they could have just walked through. That wasn't a minecart, it was a mine exercise bike? On wheels? Whatever, the point is, it's stupid and pointless. Then it's revealed that, zo -MG, there is no Cerebus, it's just a recording. We don't even have Mal smack Celia while this little brat stifles a giggle after just playing a joke on her. I think the writers just forgot that they had Celia allude to knowing about the dog recording. Can I stop giving this movie a chance now? It could get better. What are you doing here? I noticed you were low on canned corn. Canned corn? Yeah, canned corn. Don't you remember how canned corn was always Hades' favorite food? Hi, Dad. What? 
Do you need a moment? Yeah, I, 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 I think I need a moment. Excuse me. Need the moment. I will say this though, in a perfect world, in a world in which these writers gave a damn about what they were doing, the Lord of the Underworld and the Mistress of All Evil would be the perfect match. Who else but Maleficent could snag that man? Okay, I'm back. Are you okay, baby? No, I'm not okay. But the show must go on. I mean, holy shit! Seriously? Nobody ever thought that this might come to play at some point. I'm not going to question Maleficent getting a piece of pointy tail from Hades. That's disturbingly appropriate. But if they have a kid together, why wouldn't Mal have the same ridiculous strength that Hercules has? I'm pretty sure that Hades and Zeus, being brothers, were cut from the same godly cloth, so it stands to reason that Hades would be on a similar level of strength as Zeus. Sure, his face caves in comically as Hercules punches him, but he's not flying back from the impact. He's strong enough to take that punch. Why isn't Mal built like She-Hulk? Maybe she doesn't have godlike strength because of the whole anti-magic thing? Okay, fine, but if that's the case, then why doesn't she just Hulk out whenever she leaves? And even ignoring the whole strength of the gods thing, why doesn't she have any kind of relationship with her father? It makes sense that Hercules wouldn't have an especially strong relationship with his father, what with them being on different planes of existence, but if Mal and her mother and her father are locked away in this square two miles of island, why wouldn't they be closer? Why wouldn't Maleficent be doing everything she could to ensure that she remained the most coveted piece of evil arm candy in their community? Why weren't both of these villains raising Mal together to make sure that she'd be rotten to the core? You abandoned me when I was a baby. No. No, I left your mother. She's... <laughs> not the easiest person to get along with. You're the god of the underworld! How not the easiest person to get along with can one mortal be?! You have to remember that in this universe, Maleficent is a very different person. Don't you want to be evil like me? Don't you want to be me? You somehow pointed out something really stupid that also makes all the sense in the world. Mal demands that Dad give her the ember, but... Oh, please. I need to sing a pointless song real quick. I was expecting you to know that you don't steal souls, you harbor them. This song goes on for longer than it should, and frankly, it doesn't sound like the arguing of an estranged father and daughter. It sounds more like a lover's quarrel. And considering that the original Hercules movie did address some, shall we say, unconventional familial relationships. And then that, that play, that, that, that Oedipus thing? Man... <laughs> I thought I had problems. <laughs> this is making me think that these two have something more than they're letting on. After the song ends, surprisingly without angry makeup sex, Hades gives her the ember. Thanks for wasting our time, Daddy. If it gets wet, it's game over. Great, it's got the same magical properties as the Wicked Witch of the West. Just in case you weren't paying attention, the Fairy Godmother's magic is more powerful than Hades and Maleficent's magic. Except Maleficent's staff is more powerful than the Fairy Godmother when it's dramatically convenient, as is the Ember of Hades, 
and the Ember of Hades is defeated by water. This is the stupidest game of rock, paper, scissors I've ever seen in my life. Meanwhile, in Ben's castle, Audrey sneaks into what's supposed to be the most heavily guarded room in the entire kingdom during a national crisis. Of course she does. Ben tries to talk her down, but she doesn't take it well. Sleeping is too good for you! <laughs> Sleeping is too good for Oregon! Then why don't you just kill everyone? Nothing says, I'm the bad guy, like inflicting a little genocide. The Descendants cross the barrier to get back to the mainland, and Harry and Gil follow through it right behind them. Yeah. Mal was so freaked out by the possibility of Hades getting out again that she decided the only thing to be done was to close off the island forever, and it never occurred to her that maybe she should be looking over her shoulder so we don't get a repeat of what happened just yesterday. Again, you're an idiot, Mal. She drops the ember, when Uma reappears and catches it. But Mal is worried about the possibility of Uma getting the ember wet, instead of being devastated by the fact that it already is wet, what with it being caught by Uma as she's rising out of the water, which, last I checked, was indeed very, very wet. Uma agrees to help them stop Audrey in exchange for letting all the kids off the island. Because, of course, Ursula would raise her daughter to care about others. And Mal agrees. Where are bikes? Oh, yeah, um, they crashed them. <laughs> yeah, because it's not like you'd want to sell them to a chop shop or anything. Morons! Here's a thought. We could try to be friends. Put our history behind us and celebrate our differences. Uh, Evie, we've already established that these enemies are forming a working alliance to deal with Audrey. Can we save the friend talk for after the mission's completed? Let's go. No. Ah! Uh, no. I'm in charge. Oh yeah, you being in charge has worked out so well thus far, hasn't it? And how convenient that Mal doesn't just immediately turn into an old lady again once she steps out of the anti-magic zone. You'd think the simplest solution to this problem would be to take everyone who's asleep and scrape all the black magic off of them that way, but because Mal's young and pretty again, she just stopped caring. How nice. They figure that everyone's asleep by looking at their tricorders, but that's not the worst of it. Guys. Hannah turned to stone. Oh no! Not Hannah! Who's Hannah? I don't know, but it's really sad! How did Mal break my spell? I don't know. And what is Uma doing here? Hey, no, 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 no! It's a good thing she didn't throw that bowl with the apples in it. I know, right? Being mean is one thing, but wasting food? That is evil! Where did they go? I don't know. I don't know, okay. I could go check for you, how about that? Stay! <laughs> uh, movie? You're supposed to be rated G. Let's ease off the pet play. We're not doing a Deadpool movie or anything. We jump back to our heroes, who are being led to Ben by following Dude. I got a scent. Very pungent cologne. Easy to track. Follow me, people. That's great, dude. FYI, I give great cuddles, too. Time and place, asshole! Why are you just sitting there? And follow me! So you can track, cuddle, and talk. Hey, do you think his puppies would be able to talk, too? <laughs> Talking puppies. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> the dog mocks me. The dog mocks me, and it has to die. Disney? Talking puppies? I can see it. Then Audrey uses her magic to get in their way, making me wonder why she doesn't just make the ceiling collapse or something. Okay! Because what could be better than another song to completely destroy an otherwise dramatic scene? Tension, suspense, f that noise! Here's a rap number with some breakdancing suits of armor. Why can't this movie just die already? This is my crew, this is my sport. Oh, just whip them out and measure them already. They ineffectively fight off the armor for a few more minutes, when Mal finally thinks about using magic to stop them. Suit of armor, strong and true. Make this metal bust the move! How about, suit of armor, stop moving? That doesn't rhyme. 
Fine. Suit of armor, lose your head. All of you fall over dead. No, 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 that's too dark. It has to be age appropriate. Make this metal bust the moon! Ah, uh, yes. Very age appropriate. Thanks, Disney Channel. Wands, lamps, and glass slippers make these knights dance like strippers! Family approved! Look, you can practically see the pole behind Uma! Here comes the bucket of water, the three of them are under a shower head, and now they're giving lap dances! Ah, uh, no! Don't bring the dog in here, please! Then the suits get really, really tired all of a sudden. I refer you to my earlier gang activity joke. So yeah, they defeat the armor by making them all finish too soon. Guys, come on. This was so great. We were a team. We worked together. What are you, their den mother? Why do you care? Save the moralizing for the end of the movie and get back to work! You are a princess, aren't you? Don't you have to see to the needs of your people or something? Stop trying to make these girls friends and save the kingdom! Speaking of saving the kingdom, has she given any thought to Doug? Of course she hasn't! You know what we should try? I don't know, but I'm strangely intrigued. An icebreaker. Movie... What is the point of setting me up like this? This is like going to a gun range and painting a target on your face. It's not gonna end well! No, instead she insists that Mal and Uma say something nice to each other before they proceed. Because I guess that's more important than stopping the crazy lady who wants to take over the kingdom. They decide to split up, and they look for clues in Audrey's dorm room as to where she might be. I'm honestly surprised that no one stopped to question the morality of invading her privacy like this, since they are rotten to the core and would be concerned about such things. After skimming through her diary, they deduce that she's in the cottage where her grandmother was raised by Flora, Fauna, and Merriweather. You know, we might have just never thought about a trio of incredibly helpful characters like Flora, Fauna, and Merriweather, but since you brought them up, movie, that only begs the question, WHY ARE THEY NOT HERE?! How do I look? Okay, the bling stays here. But she's bad. And we're not. It's got to be bad. Have I said how stupid this movie is? The boys, meanwhile, are looking for Ben by wandering aimlessly through the kingdom. Gil decides to do the icebreaker thing that Evie mentioned earlier, but Harry's getting sick of it. I never thought it could relate to this guy, but here we are. Hmm. I can't tell what's worse. Harry trying to make eating a berry look threatening, or Harry failing at trying to make eating a berry look threatening. I'm sorry, but you can't make anything scary by doing this weird thing that you're always doing, laddie. And it was such good casting, too. The writers ruined it, just like they did everything else in the movie. Before the girls can look for Audrey at the fairy's cottage, they make a pit stop at Evie's B&B because... Um, anyway, they find Dizzy and the Smealing sleeping peacefully inside. Sure is lucky that these kids were already sitting in this couch when they fell asleep. Everyone who fell asleep while they were driving their cars, they're all dead now. Uh, who's the dude? Doug. Doug. Wake up. Wake up? It's a magic sleep! You can't wake him up just by nudging him and asking him to! You were supposed to be the smart one, Evie! Stop. Being. Stupid! Is she not a fast learner? She's emotionally involved, okay? Ah, gotcha. A woman can be smart until her emotions get in the way and make her stupid. Makes sense. <sighs> you can't tell me that that's not what the movie just said! I know! Well, in that case, she should be able to wake him up. True Love's Kiss? It doesn't matter if True Love's Kiss is enough to undo this spell or not. 
I'm just blown away by how it's Uma to think of this before anyone else. Right? You'd think with Maleficent that Mal would be the first one to think of True Love's Kiss. I hate you. I know! True Love's Kiss works every time. Well, we haven't actually used the L word yet. Strange. I don't remember them saying the L word in any other situation where True Love's Kiss saved the day. I can't kiss her. She hasn't given me True Love's consent. She asks to be left alone. Then she wastes more time by singing another song. Don't freak out, it's okay, cause true love can save the day. And I think we feel the same, but I don't know. He's so good, got my back, but maybe I'm just too bad. You were trying to get these other bad guys to say something they like about each other. Stop trying to tell us that you're bad, you dumb bimbo, and just kiss him already! Yeah! I'm sorry, but this song is just completely wrong. Sure, the lyrics tell us that she's nervous about whether they truly love each other or not, but the combination of music and choreography clearly says, Oh yeah, I'm gonna get me a piece of that. We're able to communicate our emotions so much more through music than mere words can express. When Tim Burton was working on The Nightmare Before Christmas, he wrote the songs with Danny Elfman long before he got the screenplay going. Can you imagine Moulin Rouge without the songs? I know I can't. But these movies, they have repeatedly, do you hear me, repeatedly used songs to rip the emotion out of multiple scenes again and again and again! Okay, fine. These songs are decent enough. They're catchy. They make for good album stock, but as elements of a movie that are meant to drive and support the emotional weight of what's going on, it's more like anti-music. Disney somehow created a series of musicals that utilize anti-music. And speaking as someone who listens mostly to film scores, that is f***ing disgusting. Here you go, out the door. It's bad enough that the music sucks out whatever emotion might be found in this scene. Now you're screwing up the lyrics, too! Sorry, I spoke too soon. There's the water bucket! No, no! Lips! Evie, lips! True Love's kiss goes on the lips! In a pro pro! <laughs> Okay, getting a little date rapey now. I know that Disney gets a lot of crap for the whole kissing girls while they're asleep thing these days, but this is going a little farther, don't you think? He's not spelled, he's roofied. Here I go. Here I go. Ugh, no! You can't start going all classically dramatic after she just did a little G-rated strip tease. They turned the musical off. Now back to the movie. <laughs> and... That's the end of that scene, I guess. Thanks for turning True Love's Kiss into more of a joke than the song did. Wow. The last two movies have been building up Ben as being the successor to the Beast, even though it doesn't make a lick of sense, since nothing about the Beast's curse suggests that it's genetic, because why would it be? And this is the result? This isn't a Beast, it's Michael Jackson with a beard! <laughs> Dude's afraid of these horrible special effects. They couldn't even digitally enhance his teeth or anything. And now they're playing tag with him? Bitch, your daddy took out an entire pack of wolves. I know it's your first day and all, but come on. But just when you think this scene couldn't get any dumber, they subdue him by pulling the oldest trick in the book, and they pull a thorn out of his paw. Then Jane shows up, spraying the beast with water from the magic lake like I suggested before. I can't even be happy that the movie's doing something kind of intelligent, because the only thing I can think of right now is, WHERE THE HELL HAVE YOU BEEN?! And why did the magic water now give Ben sharp teeth and reduce his fur to nothing but a Captain America beard? 
Is this the beast that Ben's supposed to be? And Audrey just turned him into this as a joke? Well, well, well. Howdy, Hook. And you, my little duckling, are ravishing. <laughs> okay, uh, ravishing and taken. <laughs> He's a pirate! Since when are pirates known for respecting people's personal boundaries? Oh, hold on. Whose side are they on? They escaped and joined us. And Mal has the Ember, which is our only hope to stop Audrey. Details to follow. The Hades Ember? Has Mal gone back to the Isle? I said details to follow. We're meeting up with Mal, Evie, and Uma. Let's go. Uma? Yes, remember Uma? The girl you were very quick to forgive for kidnapping you and threatening to take over your kingdom? Why are you now shocked by her involvement? Hey, Jay, um... <clears throat> yeah, thanks for saving me. Gorgeous face. Yeah, because it's not like he could save himself by using that hook of his to gut Ben like a fish. But then I suppose it would be hard to do that when you're doing your impression of Lucky the Leprechaun, laddie. It's magically delicious. Wow. I've heard of women having their cake and eating it too, but damn! They've got quite the appetite between them. Since these girls forgot about what they're supposed to be doing, Audrey once again shows off her inexplicable magic prowess by boarding up the entire cottage. What, does she think that these kids are the aliens from Signs and Wood is their only weakness? And again, I have to ask, why doesn't she just make these kids blow up or something? You've caused my friends pain and fear! We've had enough! Now disappear! You guys, I'm sorry my spells aren't working! Audrey's magic is getting stronger! You, you caused, caused our friends pain and fear! We've had enough! Now disappear! Oh, okay. Yeah, great. So the only thing that can defeat the magic of Maleficent's staff is Hades' ember and... holding hands. I agree. You did it. Together. This is what I've been talking about. Okay! We get it! Friendship is good! Shut up and move on! One might even say that friendship is magic! Ignoring that. Then the boys show up, because I guess they made plans earlier to meet back here while the girls are busy doing nothing. Okay, so we all think that Audrey could be a fairy cottage. We have no idea where it is. Did she ever take you there? And they couldn't consult a map because... Why wouldn't they know where the cottage is? Her mom knew where to find it. Why couldn't she ask her? Oh wait, she couldn't ask her because her mom was still a lizard, despite bringing her back to the island which should have wiped Maleficent squeaky clean of her lizardization. And don't tell me that turning her into a lizard was an example of good magic, which falls through the cracks of this stupid anti-magic thing which apparently only suppresses evil magic. I'd like to turn her into a fat old hop -tongue. You know our magic doesn't work that way. It can only do good, dear, to bring joy and happiness. Well, that would make me happy. They said it themselves. Turning Maleficent into something she isn't would be not good. Which means that this not good magic should have been wiped away as soon as Maleficent got back to the island. We all think that Audrey could be a fairy cottage. We have no idea where it is. Did she ever take you there? Every fairy godmother's day. Doug, go with Jane. We need to find fairy godmother. They might need some muscle. Hey. Well, I'll go. Yeah, actually, I would feel better. Yeah, actually, I'd feel better, too. Same. Actually, I would too. They just insulted Doug's manhood, and he's totally fine with it. And they turn to Gil for muscle, who so far hasn't done anything to demonstrate that he's particularly strong, but we're just left to assume that he's strong because he's the son of Gaston. So are these kids supposed to be like their parents, or aren't they? Or maybe they're insinuating that he's strong because he's stupid? Yeah, that makes sense. Gotta love it when a movie's statement of purpose is to break some stereotypes just so we can go on enforcing others. Isn't that right? Emotionally involved and therefore stupid Evie? And they need to look for the fairy godmother? What are they supposed to do when they find her exactly? I'm pretty sure Jane just forgot about the whole magic water thing. Ben leads them to the cottage, which he apparently visits every year. I never thought of inviting Mal along. What an asshole. And they have to sneak to it so they aren't discovered. Through our unity, we're indivisible. Now make us all invisible. You want to try using some proactive magic, Mal? Audrey is nowhere to be found but they do find Chad locked in the closet. Chad? I want my mommy. 
It's okay. What happened, buddy? He was in the closet. Nothing happened. It wouldn't be nothing if he was claustrophobic. Mm, no, that wouldn't be nothing. If they established it. Then Chad just runs away before he can tell them anything of importance, like where Audrey can be found. Thanks, Chad. Boy, were you vital to the story. Meanwhile, Jane, Gill, and Doug come across Fairy Godmother. Oh my gosh. Hi, Mom. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. She can't. Stop being dumb, Jane. We're going to figure out how to undo this. We'll find a way to make this right, Mom. You know how to make it right! Just get a whole bunch of those water pump things, fill them up with water from the Magic Lake, and squirt them on everyone until everyone's back to normal! STOP BEING DUMB! We jump back to the rest of the Descendants as they just casually mosey out of the cottage. I know they don't have any leads on where Audrey might be, but couldn't they look like they're walking back to campus with a sense of purpose or something? Someday, you're gonna have to tell me how you guys all got teamed up. Like this. Hey, we should team up. That's a good idea. Next. Actually, Mal promised to let all the kids off the aisle once this is over. This prompts Mal to confess that she was going to close off the island completely. She doesn't correct herself by saying this was the original idea, but all of their teamwork and cooperation helped to realize how unfair a decision that was. She just says, yeah, I'm closing out the island and that's that. So yeah, everyone's pissed off at Mal since we need them all to be pissed off at her at this point in the story. And Celia tosses the ember into this convenient bucket of water. Yeah, sorry, kind of hard for me to think this is terrible when it's pretty damn obvious that Audrey's going to be defeated by the power of friendship. Uma! Evie, I thought you were going to stand up for the VKs. But instead you lied to them. And you lied to Jay. And you lied to Carlos. And you lied to me. Wow, imagine that. You were lied to by someone who insists on calling herself rotten to the core. Shocker. Then Mal's friends are all turned into stone, which does not prompt Mal to feverishly look around for Audrey, who must be within earshot, because why the hell would they only turn into stone now unless she was there to do it herself? Here you are alone, and you deserve it. Your friends have turned to stone, and that's on you. God, where's Chief Bogo when you need him? Life isn't some cartoon musical where you sing a little song and your insipid dreams magically come true. So let it go. Your friends kick you to the curb. Good. You brought this on yourself, Mal. You figure out how to fix it. Let's go. Life is not a storybook. Well, you're right about that. Apparently, life's an iPad. But life unfolds in chapters. Turn the page. Oh good, it's not enough that we're stuck with another song that does nothing but tell us that Mal's sad without making us feel sad with her. Now we get some stock footage from the other movies because this movie has no idea what to do with itself. Three and a half minutes of your life that you'll never get back later, Mal goes all dragon to find Audrey on a rooftop with Celia as a hostage. Wouldn't it make more sense if she got her mitts on Dizzy or something? How did she get Celia without Uma and her cronies noticing? Unfortunately, Mal can't defeat Audrey because she can't reignite the Ember. We're stronger together. We're stronger together. I'm right here, Mal. Regain your might and ignite. I'm right here, girl. I'm right here. Uma is throwing herself at Mal to be your friend again? Son of a bitch. And you don't make the scary dragon have an awe face. This isn't Dragon Tales. A little too close. So yeah, the magic of friendship is enough to reignite this thing. Which means that the powers of the god of the underworld is based on the magic of friendship? What? 
And Mal can now stand up to Audrey. You want a piece of this? Yes. So after a few seconds of sparring, Audrey is knocked out, and if her clothes being restored to normal is any indication, the evil that consumed her soul brought on by anger and hate has left her completely. Apparently, ultimate evil can be defeated if you just shove it hard enough. Don't examine the body, grab the staff, and get it as far away from her as possible, you idiot! Now that Audrey's not evil anymore, I guess, everyone in the kingdom comes back to life. Mom! Mom! Pippity Bobbity, what happened? <coughs> Party on, Garth! Party on, other Garth! They bring Audrey back to her room and mourn her apparent death with the same kind of reverence that the dwarves had for Snow White. Sorry, movie, but it's really hard to make me feel sad for the death of a megalomaniac when you've done nothing to make me sympathize with her before now, and certainly not when said megalomaniac's death is enough to undo her many, many crimes. Seems like balance has been restored if you ask me. But no, for some reason, Mal feels guilty about this crazy lady shuffling off this mortal coil. She thinks that she can convince Hades to help her bring her back, with no other insight as to why he might help them aside from, he's my father. And the other kids decide to go back to the island. I really think that Evie was right. And I do think that we could have been friends. Or maybe, I don't know, I made the wrong decision, I'm sorry I lied to you, I want to take down the barrier? Why are you so insistent on keeping these people imprisoned when the entire movie was about defeating someone who's supposed to be a good guy? Why are you so adamant about keeping them locked away when you yourself saw that there is good in these people? Admit to your mistake and bring them all to the mainland already! So they bring Hades over, and again I have to ask, what the hell is Belle wearing? The pantsuit is old as time? They unbind him so he can do his thing. But his hair only catches on fire like it's supposed to be after they give him his ember, implying that this god's power comes from... a rock. I thought his godhood would be restored after being released from these completely ordinary-looking but allegedly magical handcuffs, but no. His unearthly powers comes from a piece of earth. That makes sense. And all I can do as I watch this resurrection is roll my eyes at just how wrong it is. If this was James Woods doing this resurrection like it should have been, he just come in and say, Bada bing, bada boom, you're alive, get up. And that'd be it. But yeah, Audrey gets up good as new, since evil can just be knocked out of a person. I'm sorry. I wanted to hurt you both. I wanted to hurt all of you. I have owed you an apology for a very long time now. And so have I. And perhaps I have owed you one, too. Yeah, I'm calling bullcrap here. Audrey apologizes for wanting to hurt everyone. Okay, good. But Mal, Ben, and Aurora's mom all apologize, but without saying for what? This movie has so little faith in the intelligence of its audience that Evie's been beating Mal and Uma over their heads with how friendship is magic. Ben, Mal, and Aurora's mom apologizing without explaining what they're apologizing about makes it look like they're not really sorry. They're just saying that they are because they feel like they should. I'm sorry, ma'am. Don't apologize to us, apologize to him. I'm sorry, Turkin. Now that that's all done with, Hades is led away to be taken back to the island. Dad! She should have been calling him Hades this whole time, and only now does she call him Dad. Yeah, get a little reverse Fresh Prince thing going on. They have a little heartfelt goodbye as Hades slips her the ember. I'm not sure what the point of that is, but whatever. Then they have a big celebration where they applaud the imminent end of the movie. I can't be Queen of Oridon. Oh. I can't turn my back on the eye. We made a decision to close the barrier forever. And it was my idea. But it's wrong. You never know where the bad is going to come from. And you never know where the heroes are going to come from either. Without Uma and her pirates, Oridon would be gone. And without Hades, 
My father... Audrey would be gone. And that's why I can't be queen of just Oridon. I have to be queen of the Isle, too. And it's time that we take the barrier down forever. Yes! <laughs> Bring it down now. You already gave a big, rambunctious cheer. You can't do a slow clap now, Carlos. So they bring down the barrier, which is met with far more approval this time around than the last time they tried this, and they have one last big musical number to celebrate. And where a live performance would be met with thunderous applause, all we get here is awkward silence. Nicely done, movie. Then everyone on the island quickly organizes a parade. Because when you're starving and living in boxes, of course you'll have the incentive and resources to throw an impromptu parade. Arts and crafts can save the world. And is that supposed to be Scar? Why would Scar be represented in this parade? He's a lion! The Beast wouldn't know of his villainy, and I would hope that he wouldn't be so stupid as to throw a lion in here where he could eat his prisoners! Then again, I would hope that the Beast wouldn't be stupid enough to start this venture in the first place, but look where we are! Daddy! Hooray, Celia, Dizzy, and the Smeelings get to see their parents again. Yeah, and where are the original Descendants' parents? They... died. Hi. And double hooray, the genocidal whack job got her happy ending. After already getting her happy ending in the first movie as she stole a little something-something from Jay when no one was looking. Why am I supposed to care about this? Hey, it's not fair to call her genocidal. She got better. Am I invited to the wedding? No, you've got souls to tend to. Get back to work. Hades gives Mal and Ben his blessing. The credits start rolling. Then we get one last twist of the knife with a final mid-credits Easter egg. Do you ever miss him? Yeah. Why? Why do you miss it? Everything about this place has been so abysmally horrible that everyone jumped ship the second that the bridge was erected. Are you noticing that no one is staying there? What could you possibly miss about it? Because we're rotten. <laughs> to, to the, the core. core. <laughs> hey, last one over the bridge? It's a right now! <laughs> there is only one thing that I can say in response to that. But my lady, who wants nothing but the best for me, has insisted that I refrain. Because I need to continue to be the guy who does not have to resort to excessive swearing or screaming in order to make his point. That's why I'm going to let this guy do it. Fuck you! So that was Descendants 3. What did you think, baby? Shut up! I tried! I wanted to defend this franchise. I wanted to like it. But the longer this movie went on, the worse and worse it got. The dialogue is awful. Most of the characters are bland and underutilized. The existence of Hades opens way too many questions that are never addressed. The plot twist of him being Mal's father means absolutely nothing. Evie demanding that Uma and Mal become friends is weird. Audrey going nuts when she seemed fine by the end of the first movie didn't make sense. And the Beast never meets any consequences for starting this mess in the first place. The nicest thing I can say about it is that the songs are catchy, but as you pointed out, they don't fit the movies at all. And what the hell was up with all the sexy dancing? Again, I need to point out that I'm no prude, but we don't need to see this kind of thing on the Disney Channel. So, basically what you're saying is... Oh yeah. 
do better, better Disney. Disney. Anybody wanna be like us? Everybody, Everybody wanna, wanna be like us. Hey, all the boys from Oregon and the girls, cause they know what's up. Your life could change today. Your life could change today. All right, all right. These streets named after us because we paved the way. Everyone come and take your shot. <laughs> Now's the time to show what you got. Cause everyone's gonna get their chance. No, no, lips, Evie, lips. True love's kiss goes on the lips. <laughs> I'm so ashamed. And that was your joke. You thought it was I funny. know. <laughs> I'm a terrible okay. person. You've made me a terrible person. It's amazing how much we've all learned and grown, but I definitely did not expect it to be this big for me and for the cast and for the channels. Hey, I'm Cameron and I play Luke. Cam to me is like, you know, he's an actor, he's like a director's actor. I think Cameron of the four of us just has like the most swag ever. Like none of us put together could ever have the amount of swag that Cameron has. Here, love us. Yes. Yeah. There is no treasure map on the back of the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> Or so you say. Oh.